Well, hi there, guys, and welcome to, um, I think this is the third um, lecture in your BTEC Level 3 Health and Social uh, Care Extended Diploma course. Um, if you remember, guys, um, in the very first lecture, I'm just going to go through my notes. In the very first lecture, we talked about... Um, assertiveness that was our very 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 first lecture and then after that we had a video lecture where we talked about the context of communication and that's where we talked about the different situations in where in which you would communicate um, and uh, we talked about um, things like one-to-one -one one -one communication um, and then we we talked about group communication um, and then multi-agency formal communication and so on and so forth now um, just to say a message hi Moshe there I've started uh, teaching now <laughs> hopefully you're able to log in uh, to the class um, also, we talked about, um, I think on the third video, we talked about the forms of communication and interpersonal interaction. So we talked about things like, you know, your speech, first language, nonverbal communication. What does that mean with your facial expressions when you're talking to people? Uh, we also talked about why it's important to listen, how things like your silence, your touch can affect communication. And I also put it into context for you and, you know, where some guys or some of you ladies or on, and maybe gentlemen might be asking me, why are you talking about communication constantly? And remember, guys, that I um, did express to say communication is absolutely important in any environment especially in health and social care because what you don't want is a situation where you assume assumption like i said guys patient is saying this what they mean and then you do something else and it can really cost either injury hurt even take a life or even make the patient feel like they're not valued okay so that's just all putting it together we talked about the different uh, communication and language preferences before uh, british sign language makatin braille written communication and so on and guys you know that the videos are available for you in class and then after that, um, I have set your first formal assignment. So, guys, we have two weeks to get the deadline um, in. So please do think about that. We then went on to talk about um, the theories and the cycle of communication. So remember, guys, and, you know, one of the assignments I gave, I noticed that some people weren't understanding what I meant by um, the cycle of communication. So please, please, please go back to my last lecture. Um, the cycle of communication was, uh, and when it means that you understand the cycle of communication, it means that you are able to say or pass across a message to somebody in such a way that they understand it. So you're able to think about what you have to say and how you have to say this so that the person you are communicating to understands. And also we talked about the different theories, uh, Mark, Michael Argyle, Tuckman's theories on uh, group formation. And our lecture today is about barriers to communication. And in this lesson today, we're going to be covering what is a barrier, okay? Um, we're going to be talking about communication barriers. We're going to be looking at types of communication. We'll be looking at empathy how important empathy is when it comes to communication. We're going to be looking at people's language needs and preferences. 
sensory impairments and disabilities, uh, barriers associated with personality, self-esteem, anxiety, and depression, um, asking questions, different types of questions. We're going to be looking at the barriers as, uh, associated with aggression and submissiveness, uh, barriers associated with assumption, barriers associated with values and belief systems, uh, barriers associated with cultural variation, the use and abuse of power, and the barriers associated with the effects of alcohol and drugs. So let's get started. Now, the first thing is we need to understand what a barrier is. What is a barrier? Now, very simply, a barrier is it blocks things and it stops them from getting through. Now, for example, um, in my days <laughs> at college, I did an engineering course, actually, and we used to put on barrier cream. Barrier cream was basically some a cream that we put on our hands when we were working on the cars to stop any oil or anything from sticking to our hands, okay? The other thing is, you know, for babies, sometimes we put on nappy rash cream, you know, pseudocrem or Vaseline or whatever. It acts as a barrier from stopping water to absorb into the skin, causing a nappy rash, okay? So that's, you know, these barrier could be a gate, a gate that's been put there from stopping people to just getting through as they feel, okay? So these are types of, you know, this is barrier. Now, there are different types of communication barrier that stops communication from being effective. And we're going to be looking at them in uh, on table 1.2, um, which would be, I think, over the next few pages. Um, before I go any further, I also have to explain what a communication barrier is. A communication barrier is anything that stops the development of understanding when people interact. So a communication barrier is anything that happens that stops people understanding when you interact with them, okay? Now, where the first uh, and second types of barriers exist, okay, um, it, is, it will usually be obvious that communication has failed. OK, there are different types of communication barriers, you know, that they basically stop co communication from being effective, like we said. And um, we'll go through the different types of barriers. And this would usually happen. And it shows that communication has failed. However, distorted understanding is not always easy to identify. And um, when you have a skilled use of commu the communication cycle, so again, knowing what you want to say, thinking about how you're going to say it, saying your message, the other person receiving it, interpreting it, and so on and so forth. So skilled use of the communication cycle may help you to check what has been understood or basically if there are any communication barriers that exist, all right? Now, on this table here which is what i mentioned here these are the three uh, some three types of barriers okay the first one is that the communication is not received so not responding to language needs or preferences probably not understanding that the person has impairment or disability now i'll explain what that means not responding to language needs or preferences it might be that you're communicating to somebody who is deaf, you don't even know that the person is deaf and you're there chatting away and the person is looking at you and not responding. And that's basically them not, communication has failed there because you don't understand their language needs, which is that they're deaf and they can't hear you. So they need somebody who can sign. OK, probably not understanding sensory impairments or disabilities. 
okay so that's another thing whereby you know you're looking at you know where a person's senses has failed for example maybe the the sense of sight or hearing you know again that's um being either deaf or blind okay so example speaking to a deaf person who uses signed language the person doesn't receive the sound so environmental barriers like background noise can also stop you from hearing a message um if you let me put it this way if you can't you're not fully deaf but you're partially deaf or the person is partially deaf if there is a lot of noise in the background it can stop you from hearing the message so you can't receive full non-verbal communication also if you can't see a person's face or body so if the person is all you know an individual is blind they can't really receive or know how your facial expression is when you're talking they might not know what your body language is so in that case the communication has failed okay so that is a type of barrier the second one is communication is received but not understood so example is a person using slang or jargon or complex language now <clears throat> it's like i don't know if you've seen maybe in the movies or you've even experienced this yourself you go to the hospital and you have a loved one there who's really sick and the doctor is there using complicated language you know terminology that only people who are also doctors can understand now the family have heard or they've received a communication well, they don't even understand what the doctor is saying. And you can see maybe sometimes in the movies, you actually say, can you please tell me in English, please, doctor? And, and, and that's basically what it means, that you've received the communication, but you don't understand. And that's basically because the person is either using complex and technical language. They're probably using slang or, or one form of the other. The third one is that the understanding is distorted. And that means a wide range of emotional and uh, psychological factors can act as barriers. Now, we'll talk about some of it. But for example, someone who is on drugs or alcohol might understand something differently. So their understanding is distorted. It's skewed. It's not as it should be because, you know, their emotions aren't right. You know, the 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 um, what's it called the alcohol or the drugs have uh, um affected their psych psychology it slowed them they're impaired a little bit at that time and so they don't understand the communication okay so these are the you, some uh, these are barriers to communication and we'll be going through um most of them over the next few slides I've got a picture here for you. Uh, it, it doesn't look so fantastic, but you can see the message here. The gentleman is sitting over here thinking, why isn't she, doesn't she know that I'm deaf? And the lady here is going, why isn't he answering me? Why is he just waving his hands to me? And that's because the, there's a barrier in communication here. The carer, let's assume this lady here is the carer, she should take the time to read maybe the, the patient's communication chart or their personal plan to understand that Mr. A here is deaf and that somebody who understands sign language needs to communicate with him. The other thing here is um, maybe psych uh, psychological factors. Uh, this is a picture here. So you have this lady who is communicating with this gentleman. He's probably afraid. Um, he's got low self-esteem. And the lady is frightening him or making him more afraid by telling him how difficult the situation is and how difficult the choice he has to make is. And the poor man here is feeling vulnerable. He's feeling, I'm afraid. This is threatening my self-esteem. How am I going to cope? 
I, do, I don't need any of it. You know, his, his psychology is not right because he feels that he's afraid. And this, you know, when you're afraid, there's a couple of things you could do. You can either become submissive or aggressive. Someone who is afraid cannot make assertive decisions. So when they're afraid, you might not mean it in a bad way, but because they're afraid, they see it differently. Okay. So again, just think about in your role in, 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 in the world of health and or social care, think about how you communicate. Always think about this because sometimes if you communicate wrongly, you can actually make people shut down. Um, I don't know if you've heard this. It's not what you say, but how you say it. So you might be telling somebody something serious, but it's how you say it that matters, okay? So do think about these things when you are communicating with people. <clears throat> the next thing we're going to talk about here, guys, is the types of communication. You have difficult communication, there's communication that's complex or sensitive. Now, before I get into the slide, I'll, I'll um, explain what they mean. Difficult communication could be, I don't know, things about um, maybe people's impairments, maybe somebody, um, things, when you talk about communication that involves maybe emotional like um, experience where maybe someone's partner has died or there's a bereavement, you know, that, that can all, often be a difficult type of communication because really, what do you say? What do you say to someone who's grieving? Okay, so it can come across as a bit difficult. And then you have complex communication. It might be, for example, that um, someone has brought their loved ones into a care home and they need to understand the amount of funding that is available to them. It's not a simple, oh, this is it. it. It is complex because they need to have a lot of information and they need an in, um, an individual that understands funding to be able to break down this complex um, communication. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I have to say here that um, some communication between people is simply about sharing or transmitting information. For example, you know, you might want to number of the bus to catch, or they might, or, you know, can I have some water, please? Sometimes the communication will be complex. For example, like I said uh, just a minute ago, a relative may want to know about funding arrangements for care. A communication about funding might involve a great deal of complex information. In this situation, it would be important to check what the relative already knew and whether or not the individual understood the information that you were providing. Because sometimes, you know, you're giving complex information. It's always important for you to check that the person understands. Again, you know, I'll give you an example. With me teaching this course, it is quite a few slides. You know, some of it could come across as complex. Hence, the option for me to check your understanding by giving you the opportunity to ask questions as the class is going on. Now, a great deal of communication in care um, involves building an understanding of another person and providing emotional support. I mean, think about it. Being in care, being in a hospital, um, working in a hospital, there is so much that goes on there, okay? And it's just like, you know, in a hospital, I'm not trying to sound like a downer or sound every time miserable but think about this people sometimes pass away in hospitals or get bad news of maybe terminal illness and you know a, a great deal of care it just it's just for you to provide emotional support. You know, some people might just want you to squeeze their hands and just let them know that you are there to support them as their nurse 
um, I remember when I, I had my daughter, you know, and ev I just had my daughter, everybody had stayed with me through the whole labor. And once the baby came out, people needed time because they were sitting beside me for 23 hours as I was in labor. And they needed to rest. So everybody went home and I was alone with this newborn baby that I had no idea what to do with. And the the nurse, the midwife or the, the nurse came to me and she said, you know, I know that you're probably scared and you're thinking, what on earth am I going to do? But if you need any help, I'm just down the hallway. Just press the buzzer and I'm, I will be there. I know you probably might want to take a shower. So just let me know and I will watch the baby while you go and take a shower. And for me, you know, I felt that she she was providing me emotional support she wasn't there to say oh i just giving me her experience no but she was just saying i know it can be hard and i'm here to support you through this difficult you know few moments okay so care is about and a great deal is about providing emotional support um to people you cannot have a nurse there is nothing worse in my opinion than a nurse who is not sensitive. And trust me when I say I've come across a few of them. You just, you know, you, you think to yourself, I'd rather be in a mental institute than have this nurse care for me. Because it's, you know, you have to be, provide emotional support to your patients, okay? Whether you're a nurse, a midwife, you know, working in dental, whatever it is. It is all part of health and social care, and you need to be able to have empathy, okay? Which we'll talk about a bit more. Now, in 1997, you had Bernard and Morrison, and there were uh, some theorists, and they argue that caring and communicating are inseparably linked. What does that mean? It means that caring and communicating are together. You cannot separate the two, okay? And it says that, they, that basically that was their argument. And they say that communication that involves emotional issues is often experienced as being difficult and sensitive. And so when you're having such discussion with people, you can't have it without being caring. So you can kind of see what their argument is. Another thing I have to say here is that there is no advice or information that is likely to be very useful to a person who is overwhelmed by grief. But many people do want someone to be with them. Communication in this um, difficult or sensitive situation should focus on emotional needs rather than giving out information. And I don't know if you remember, guys. Um, in our um in the last homework i gave about karen and um jasmine where jasmine's uh, partner had just died and question number two talks about how would jasmine feel if karen just says oh don't worry you'll be fine in no time jasmine doesn't need anyone to give her advice but just someone to provide emotional support just focus on their emotional needs maybe get them to talk about themselves more maybe talk about their loved ones more remember some nice things about their loved ones but it's not for you to give them any advice because no advice what kind of advice can you give someone who has just lost their partner okay or a child or a parent or whatever it is you know or whoever they've lost but what kind of advice can you give Nothing will matter at that time. And so as a someone in a, in a caring position in healthcare, it's just focusing on their emotional needs at the time. Now, in 2003, Enger Bretson uses the idea, <clears throat> pardon me, of a caring presence to explain what is needed in these situations. Before we go on, I have to explain what a caring presence is. A caring presence means being open to the experience of another person through a two-way encounter with that person, okay? And creating a caring 
presence is about sharing and understanding of the feelings that other people may be experiencing. This is where it comes with empathy, okay? And I'll explain that a bit more. Communication, again, like I said, in this situation should please don't give them advice when they're in this type of situation but you are there <clears throat> to empathize with them all right now sometimes simply being with a person who is lonely who is anxious who is depressed can provide comfort to them you don't need to say anything you don't need to give them advice on how to come out of loneliness you could just be there with them play a game with them i remember many years ago when i worked in a care home there was this gentleman he nobody people didn't really speak much to him because he had a stroke and um his family didn't come to see him much and um i remember i saw him and um, he was just on his own and i went over to him and i was just like oh hello how are you you look very handsome like my daddy you know i was drawn to him actually because he he looked a bit like my father um and um i said to him oh you look so handsome like my dad and you know even though he couldn't speak to me just being there and talking to him you could see his eyes really light up and um i remember there was a, a piano in in uh, in there was a piano in the care home and i just got on the piano you know pushed his um wheelchair next to me and i was just playing the piano and just playing lots of songs talking to him and everything and i will never forget that day he had tears in his eyes and it wasn't because I, I was so miserable, although I thought that was why, you know, I got upset because I thought, oh my God, I've upset him and he never wants to see me again. But someone said to me that this piano has been in this care home for 15 years and nobody has ever touched it. And to have you play it, and this man, we've never seen him light up so much, and all the other residents came round and were talking to me and so on and so forth. And it's just, I wasn't giving him any advice on how to get his children to visit him, but it's just that empathy of taking the time out, to focusing off his, on his emotional needs by talking to him, reading stories to him, playing music, that's that's you know that's a form of empathy now if you believe that your carer understands your needs and is concerned about you then just knowing that they are near you can help you feel supported nonverbal communication which is communication that doesn't involve spoken words but maybe things like body language facial expression may sometimes communicate emotions and feelings more effectively than words you know it's just like for example someone is about to take injections you know i feel like i'm saying a lot about <laughs> the things i'm scared of but i am afraid of needles oh my god do you know i'd rather go and stand at the top of the highest building and look down than for me to have injections that is how afraid i i'm i would rather sit in in in, in a in a den with a lion than take injections and just having a nurse squeeze my hand to say you know what don't worry you can do it it's okay don't worry it means a lot more she doesn't have to say anything just squeezing my hand shows that she's there and it communicates more than a thousand words if you can support people just by the way you are present with them this may be because you are developing empathy with them now empathy involves a caring attitude where someone can see beyond his or her own assumptions about the world and they can imagine the thoughts and feelings of someone else a professional care worker who can empathize will be able to imagine the emotions associated with the pain and the grief that another person is experiencing so a professional care worker if someone's just lost somebody or is afraid or is in a difficult they can you know just imagine like put themselves in the shoes of that person and empathize with them and when you when you 
kind of imagine what the person is going through, you can provide support, okay? Now, did you know that empathy is often regarded as a skill that can be developed through training? But then that you have a, a Carl Rogers, who's a famous counselor, argued that empathy was a state of being. This means that you have to experience yourself and other people in a special empathetic way. In Rogers' view, you couldn't simply use empathy as a communication tool or technique. You had to live empathy. And I can see <clears throat> what he or um, this Carl Rogers is, is saying um, you you have to because you have some people who simply don't understand and they have to have gone through training to understand how to empathize with others and um, you have to live also empathy you have to have that caring nature to want to understand what people are going through for you to be able to have more empathy okay so empathy is basically one of the ways of um, reducing, would I say, barriers to communication. The next one is language needs and preferences. Most people will have a preferred first language and this preferred language will sometimes be obvious to you, sometimes but not always. But language needs to go beyond the choice of a preferred language. Different communities use a given language in different ways. People use degrees of formality and informality depending on the context. I'll give you an example. People use jargon, dialect or slang to communicate effectively with people in their own speech community. These differences can create barriers to understanding. I'll actually give you a, a non-related um, healthcare example. Recently, my husband came to me and he said, um, I, um, he said to me, one of his uh, colleagues um, said to him here in England, said to him, oh, you are wicked, man, you're wicked. And my husband thought that the person, he was actually quite upset. He thought the person said he was a wicked person. And I said, oh, no, 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 darling. What that means is that you, you're, and when some, you know, and that's, that can sometimes create a communication barrier because as soon as the person said to my husband, you're wicked, man, he just thought, oh my God, he's insulting me and he shut down. But it's a slang. You're wicked. You're sick. It means that, you know, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing. But he thought, oh my God, this person has just insulted me. And I obviously, it didn't help, but I said, you're a sick man. But basically, what I was just trying to say was, darling, no, he means you're such an amazing person. This person is just saying that you're so professional, you're amazing, and he loves actually working or interacting or having business with you. And, and, and that's what it means. But you can see where that can create a, a barrier in communication because someone who doesn't understand that is a slang could actually just be defensive or tell you off and say, why are you calling me sick? Or do I look sick to you? Or why are you calling me wicked? What have I ever done to you? Okay. So sometimes slang, okay, can create a barrier um, in communication. Another thing, for example, is in this part, in this country, you have people, you know, say things, you're right, darling. How are you doing, darling? If you're the further up north you go, you're right, sausage, you're right, duckling. People maybe from other countries who have just come into the UK might not even understand that. And they might think, oh, especially if, if it was a, a woman maybe saying it to a man or a man saying it to a woman, oh, this person is trying to, you know, have inappropriate advances towards me. And they wouldn't just understand that. It's just um, basically just as people having their own use of language, dialect, you know, speech communities, those, those sorts of things. Okay. So, when you are within care, do think about people's language needs, language preferences, as much as possible, strip down 
move away from the technical language and as much as possible just speak to the um, patient or the service user quite plainly. Another barrier to communication is uh, sensory impairment and disability. Now, a sensory impairment means that a person's senses do not work effectively. Impairments create the first kind of communication barrier where the information is not fully received. Disability is not the same as an impairment. Some people experiencing barriers because of their difference may have a communication disability. Now, here's an example. A deaf person whose preferred language is the British Sign Language. Don't forget, guys, in our last lecture, I mentioned that the British Sign Language is a language in its own. It's not English interpreted into sign. It is a language on its own. OK, so a deaf person whose preferred language is the B BSL or British Sign Language experiences no problems communicating with another person who is good at signing British Sign Language. This person may not be able to communicate with people who, who use spoken English without the aid of an interpreter. So if you want to communicate with somebody who uses sign language and is deaf, you need and you don't sign, you might need to speak and the other person will sign. However, in this case, the disability is a social issue. So and, and the reason <clears throat> it is a social issue is because the person needs an interpreter. So that makes it a kind of like a disability. OK, um, rather than a sensory impairment issue. OK, so do consider the both when you're communicating within um, healthcare, You need to think about people's methods of communicating, whether they have any sensory impairments or they use sign language. You have to use pictures or symbols or anything like that. OK, so do you communicate and do you. Um, think about these uh, barriers um, to communication. Now, we're going to look at the barriers associated with personality, self-esteem, anxiety and depression. Sometimes care workers can create their own barriers because they feel stressed by the emotional needs of the people they work with. Listen, Care work or being a nurse, a midwife, it is a stressful job. It is. And sometimes you find that care workers or even the nurses, they can sometimes shut down, okay, um, and they create a barrier. And you might be thinking, oh, God, this nurse is just absolutely terrible. But you might not know that, you know what, she finds this situation stressful. And the only way she can deal with it is by creating a barrier. And that can be because maybe the person has been listening to others. Listening to others can involve hearing about frightening and depressing situations. Sometimes all I need to do is listen to my sister, who's a nurse. And I think to myself, oh, God, I never want to, be, <laughs> want to be a nurse. But, you know, it does have its amazing sides. You know, you you are part of a community of people that take care of us, the general public. OK. Um, and sometimes carers um, stop listening in order to avoid painful memories. Tiredness also um, and lack of time or desire to avoid emotional stress can create a barrier to providing care, um, caring communication. And, and that's true. Um, I remember recently, and this is my experience actually, um, I had to take my daughter to the hospital to get her uh, cast changed because she broke her arm. And the nurse, I felt that she wasn't caring. You're dealing with a child who's, who's very little. It's about three years old. Try and be a bit caring when you're talking to the child. You know, I, as the mom, kept thinking, do you know what? She's not a very caring nurse. It could be she's tired. It could be she doesn't have time. Or it could be that she's emotionally stressed and she's just blocked off 
anything that can make her provide caring communication by assuring the child that you're about to use a saw to cut off their calf, that you're not going to cut off their arm, okay? It's just, you know, to assure them, you know, it's okay, you know, this is only tickles, it's going to just help to cut off um, the, 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 the cast and I can put a new one. But then the poor child will see this little machine coming and think you're going to grind off her arm. So it's, it's, it's quite important for you to think about these things when you're dealing with people. Because, you know, the woman or the nurse has seen it that I, all I'm doing is a job to cut off the cast. Um, because it was a hard ca cast fiberglass. I just want to cut off the cast. But this little three-year-old is thinking, screaming, this nurse is about to cut off my, you know, to this three-year-old, this little machine is a chainsaw that she's going to use to cut off her whole arm, okay? So you can see the barrier in communication there. But if this lady had taken the time to say, oh, hello, little one, look, it's amazing. It's not going to cut off your arm. Look, let me just try it on mummy, okay? Look, it's, it's just, it only tickles. Look, it's not going to do anything, all right? I'm not going to hurt you, and I'll give you a sticker when you're done. That can do a whole lot, okay? So do you think about the barriers that maybe come with, you know, self-esteem, your personality? Because you never know how the other person sees you. And you are in a caring job. You're in a job where you're meant to care for people. Also, building an understanding of another person and establishing a caring person presence can be very difficult when their personality or self-esteem needs uh, self-esteem needs create a barrier you can see for example maybe somebody has a low um, self-esteem or their personality it can be difficult for you to have a caring um, presence because no matter what you do it looks like you're not making any difference again you know and let's use the case of maybe a three-year-old and you're trying to, to take off the, the cast. It could be that there's nothing you can do to, to help the child because all they see is this monster-looking machine. Or um, another experience I had was um, taking uh, my daughter to the GP and the GP did her absolute best. My daughter doesn't like it when people try to look in her eyes. She thinks you're trying to poke things in her eye. And, you know, bless the doctor, she tried everything to provide a caring presence for my daughter while she looks in her eye. But all my daughter kept shouting was, step away from me, you monster, you're a monster. But of course, the doctor wasn't a monster. It's just that at that time, her self-esteem was low and she was frightened. So no matter what the doctor did, it didn't make any difference, okay? So sometimes that happens and you still have to keep on trying to have a caring presence and show empathy and still do your job, okay? Many people who are depressed or anxious experience negative, negative thoughts that just come to them. So attempting to understand these thoughts and feelings can feel like trying to f find a, a way through a brick wall. It can just seem impossible. It may feel as if there's an emotional barrier that's preventing the person from experiencing any positive emotion, okay? Um, as part of this um, course, I'm going to put up a case study for you. It's about Liam and his uh, carer. And basically what it is, is that um, Liam is going through some depression, okay? Um, and he, he just keeps telling his carer, oh, you just don't understand what it feels like to be me. Absolutely everything is wrong with my life. I have no reason to be alive. You can't help me. What's the point in talking to me? You have to realize that when you are facing someone who's having this depression, um, it might be good to get them talking more, okay? So in this case, the carer is asking some more um, questions open-ended questions and that's what we're going to go through in the next few slides so just to give you some background information um i've just talked about the case study which i'll put in the classroom it's about liam who's going through serious depression 
okay? He feels nobody understands him. He feels his situation is so bad. And the carer is trying to make the conversation to be positive, to push the conversation towards his positive memories. The worker is using her understanding of, the, of Liam's past to try and lead the conversation around the barrier of negative and depressed thoughts. So she's trying to get him to think happy thoughts. If the worker is su uh, successful, the conversation might lead Liam to having more possible thoughts um, and increase his self-esteem. And this is, over the next few slides, we're going to talk about how you might possibly do that or work with people who are um, having some depression or negative thoughts. And that is basically asking questions. Talking through difficult, complex or sensitive issues will involve the verbal skills of asking open questions, maybe using probes and prompts within a conversation. So there are different types of questions, open questions. These questions cannot be answered with a yes or no response. They require a person to think about their answer. Open questions are likely to involve a complex communication cycle in order to discuss issues. They include questions such as how would you describe the quality of your life? What would you do if this were to happen? These kind of questions, they get the person to talk more. So for example, in Liam's case, the um, carer could say, um, tell me more about your life. Tell me the things that you like. And it's about getting Liam to talk more. The next type of, uh, or type of question is using probes. Probes are very short questions, such as, can you tell me more? Probes are used, when you probe somebody, you use it to dig deeper into the person's answers. They investigate what the other person has just said. So if, if you had a, a patient that came to you and said, I've got a headache, I've been having this headache since last week, you could ask, can you tell me more? Do you have the headache in the morning? Do you have it in the afternoon? Can you tell me what the headache feels like? What part of your head? These are probes to dig in deeper. Then you have prompts. They're short questions which you offer in order to prompt them to answer. Prompts are questions such as, would you do that again? Okay, so these are things that just get you, if someone says that, so it could be, you know, the, the, you've asked the person the question and they said, oh, I have the headache. It's just on the front and the back of my head. You could say this part of your head or maybe this part of your head. That is a prompt to get the person to be more specific. Okay, so think about this. If you're in that opportunity and position and you're dealing with somebody who is probably facing depression negative thoughts maybe they've just closed off emotionally you can probe prompt maybe ask open questions gently to nudge them to come out of their sh shells okay some of you might remember this <laughs> um assertiveness submissiveness uh passiveness and and all the rest of it now it is a barrier to communication so you have barriers associated with aggression and submissiveness when a person experiences strong emotions or their self-esteem is threatened that person may become aggressive or withdrawn and that creates a barrier to communication. An example could be, maybe I remember, um, again, you know, I can I, um, um, use examples from the point of view of, of a patient so that you understand. I remember, again, a couple of years ago when I had a loved one in hospital, you know, it was just a little uh, child. And... Um, what made them go to hospital was um, actually quite serious and um, this little child was in so much pain and the doctors were trying everything they could do and you could just see each time they tried the child just cried more and more and um, I remember one time some doctors came to help this little child and the mother had had enough so she got aggressive 
and she just ordered. She said, all of you get out, 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 out. I am tired of you poking and prodding my child and nothing is going. She just, at that moment, just felt, she just felt threatened, you know. Um, she experienced strong emotions by seeing her child in so much pain and not knowing what was going on. So she created a barrier and that barrier was in the form of being aggressive. Okay, so do think about these barriers, and sometimes it might be to give the person space to calm down, to cool off, and then come back again and try. You also have barriers associated with assumptions. You guys should know how much I talk about assumptions by now. I always say never, ever, ever assume anything. It is dangerous to assume, especially in healthcare. Building an understanding of other people's needs, it takes time and effort. Jumping to conclusions and making assumptions can save mental time and effort. Yes, it can. It can save effort, mental effort and time. But assumptions may cause us to misinterpret what another pe person is trying to communicate. For example, you might believe that you don't need to listen to a person because you already know their needs, what their needs are, but you should never assume. Care workers who use, um, but care workers who use the communication cycles are less um, likely to make assumption. When you use um, the communication cycle well about thinking about what you're going to say, asking questions, checking, understanding, and, and all the rest of it, you're less likely to make any assumptions because you always check your understanding. Assumptions can create a barrier because people stop listening. They stop checking their understanding of other people's communication. You just think, oh, I know her. I know what she's like. It's very dangerous because people change, okay? Some people may make assumptions that people who have a disability are damaged normal people. When disabled people are seen in this way, they might be pitied or ignored. And, I, you know, I do have to say this, actually. I remember um, many years ago uh, where I used to work, um, a lady was in a wheelchair. Now, you see this beautiful woman um, and you don't know that she drives a BMW. You just assume that because she's in a wheelchair, she's damaged and probably being picked up by the local, you know, transport agency. Well, she drives a spanking new brand, a spanking new BMW sports car, might I add. OK, but you people without knowing who she is, you just make an assumption that, oh, she's disabled. She can't do anything for herself. She's in a wheelchair, but no, she had a very good job, a top job as a manager, okay? And she drove a very nice car that worked for her. She was able to get herself out of the car in and out well, okay? And she didn't need to be pitied by anybody. In fact, I have to add, she absolutely hated it when people pitied her, all right? Now, People with communication differences are sometimes assumed to be mentally impaired. Older people are sometimes seen as demented or confused if they do not answer questions quickly, correctly, and clearly. If care workers do not bother to check their assumption about people, these assumptions can turn into prejudices, and that's true. And a prejudice or prejudgment can result in discrimination. Let's look at it this way. Quite simply, have you ever been driving, if you do drive, on the motorway and you see someone driving slowly? I know, um, um, I know some men do this. They assume the person is either a woman or they're old. It's, it's a prejudice, okay? It's a pre-assumption and, and it's not right. You might not know that the person is just trying to stay safe or they don't like to drive on a high speed, okay? Also, when someone is having a communication difficulty, maybe they don't answer questions quickly, we assume that they're retarded or you know, they're mentally challenged. It's not always the case. So never in your care role assume anything so that you don't get to the point where you're being accused of discrimination.
The next thing we're going to talk about is the barriers associated with assumptions. Okay. Um, oh, I've actually. Sorry. Barriers assumptions and belief systems. People have different belief systems about what is important in life and how people should live their lives. And I'll give you an example. Some people actually believe that once a woman has given birth to a child, she should just start working part time. And you're actually seen as odd if you go back to work full time. That's some people's belief system. Okay. Um, some people also then have values or people have values and values are the principles that we think of as being important or valuable in terms of how we live our lives. For example, some people say my family come before anything. Some people might say my dogs come before anything. Some people might say, I love my car. Those are the things that they hold to be quite important to them in terms of how they live their life. So you need, and, and in healthcare, um, you, need, you will come across this. For example, it, a belief system is people from a, a, a particular faith um, in Christianity called the Jehovah Witness. They don't believe in blood trans, having blood transfusions. So how do you deal with somebody whose loved one is losing blood and fast? And they're saying to you, according to our faith, God does not allow us to, it is a sin for us to accept a blood transfusion. And so what you would have at that moment in time is a barrier in communication because there is almost nothing you can say to that person to make them believe that the only way to save the life of their loved one is by accepting a blood transfusion. So what do you do in that case? So when you're dealing with people that have a different belief system, it could actually be for you to try and find out more by asking open-ended questions, by having empathy as well, and being open in communication to see what else you can do as a carer, or you know maybe a doctor in this case, um, to be able to break down that barrier, okay? Now, you do have also people's values. It could be that you are meeting someone that places a value on something within, you know, a, a care um, or healthcare system. How do you deal with them? So you do have to think about these things, okay? Now, the barriers associated with cultural variation, the differences in culture. Culture refers to the different customs and assumptions that communicate, uh, sorry, that communities of people adopt. Different ethnic and religious groups may have different cultures, but different age, occupational and geographical groups also make different cultural assumptions. Words and nonverbal communication can be interpreted differently depending on the context and on the culture of the person using them. I'll give you an example. The word hot, it can have different meanings. It depends on the context or the situation that you are using it and the culture of the person that you're using it. Now, when we say about culture, different, you know, obviously you have different cultures, okay? Uh, different ethnic groups, different uh, religions. But you also have different age cultures, people from different age groups. They have their own culture. Teenagers, I think they have a culture of their own, for example. Different geographical uh, locations, they do have their culture. So let me break this down. In a formal context, hot means having a high temperature. Oh, you're hot to the touch. This pan is hot. This heater is hot, okay? But in other speech communities, an object that is hot could be, for example, that it's been stolen and is perceived as very desirable. Oh, this is a hot item. You know, this is a hot item. It's been stolen, but I really want to buy it or, I, you know, whatever that is. And that is a different speech community. A hot, um, also, you can talk about maybe like teenagers, for example, or maybe some people not teenagers. A hot person, oh, this, this person, she's so hot. It can mean somebody that is very good, good looking. Oh, they're so hot, they're very attractive. 
that could that 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 that's what hot might mean to some people. A hot person could also be someone that's very good at doing something. Okay, so if communication is only interpreted from a fixed cultural standpoint, there can be serious misunderstandings. So to make sense of a spoken and nonverbal language, you need to basically understand the context of the interaction and basically what the person is trying to communicate. And always, 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 always check your understanding. Now, let me give you something to think about. Think about some of the words that mean different things depending on the cultural context in which they use. One of them is actually the word chilling. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just chilling. Obviously, chilling means that you've put something in the fridge to start chilling or getting cold. Chilling means, oh, I'm just good. I'm resting. Okay? Depending on the cultural variation. So do think of some words that could mean different things. Also, an example of non-cultural variation might be a hand gesture, okay? In which, for example, you know when you, you put your palm up to say stop, okay? Stop, don't do that. In England, when you put your palm up, you know, you say stop, okay? That is stop. But in Greece, that actually means, it, could, it means you are dirt. It's actually considered a very offensive gesture. Also, I've known, for, for example, in some um, communities, or maybe the, the teen, when, we, when I was younger, definitely, that gesture means, oh, listen, I'm not even listening to you. That was a barrier. Like when somebody was talking and you put your hand to be like, oh, just shut up. I'm not listening to you. So it could mean anything. Okay. Now, why do the same physical movements have different meaning? One explanation could be that the British, ver British version of the palm and the fingers gesture means, I arrest you. You must not do it. Whereas the Greek interpretation goes back to medieval times when criminals, hand, uh, when criminals had dirt rubbed in their faces to show how much people despised them. Okay? So it is important not to make assumptions about nonverbal and even verbal always be checked okay and non-verbal messages depending on the circumstance of the people who are sending them all right so i know we've talked a lot about communication and communication is a very big unit but it is the essence it is the importance of your job in health and social care so never ever underestimate anything or estimate anything in um, or assume anything in your job role in healthcare. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the barrier that comes with the use and the abuse of power. And remember that is the base, uh, the barriers um, associated with um, you know, um, assumption, cultural variation. One of them actually is the use and abuse of power. The General Cal Care Council, which is the GSCC, Code of Practice for Social Care Workers of 2002, requires all workers to respect individuality and support people who use service to control their own lives. However, there is always a danger that if a care worker is short of time, they will seek to control people who use services. That is an abuse of power. And if a care worker deliberately controls and manipulates others, then that's not good. If you cannot control and make decisions about your own life, you may fail to develop or you might lose your sense of being a worthwhile person. If care workers control and manipulate you, your self-esteem may be damaged. Care workers should basically seem to um, seek to empower people who use the services, whether it's a hospital or um, um, whether you're a midwife, whatever, you should empower people. Empowerment means giving power to others. People who use services should be empowered to believe that they can make their own choice, choices and take control of their own lives, okay? 
Now, this is basically a diagram here. And you can see is how do these nonverbal messages express power and um, uh, domination? So let's look at this. When somebody ha has a difference in height, when they're taller than you, or they, um, they, they, they're sort of taller than you and you're sat down, it's, it's a way of domination. Look, I'm bigger than you, I'm stronger than you, okay? Second thing is fixed eye contact. That could be aggressive, where you're staring at the person and you're trying to abuse your power by staring them down. They can get intimidated. You're looking at them aggressively. Inappropriate use of touch, dragging the person, pulling them. That's an abuse of power. Workers ignoring feedback. That's an abuse because you think, oh, I'm better than them. Or you think, oh, they can't do anything. Oh, after all, they, you know, they have no self-esteem. They're in a wheelchair. They can't talk. They can't speak. And you try to abuse your power. So look at this picture, okay? And uh, think about what this person might be doing to actually abuse their power. Now, lastly... And then <laughs> you guys can go. <laughs> um, is the barriers associated with the effects of drugs and alcohol? Alcohol and drugs can influence a person's ability to send clear verbal and non verbal messages. Drugs that affect the functioning of the central nervous system can easily result in messages not being received or understood, and also um, in distorted interpretations of the message. Alcohol and drug abuse can therefore create all the barriers to communication shown. Um, basically, there was um, um, a figure that I basically sh uh, showed earlier, but basically alcohol and um, drug use can actually create barriers in communication. People with a distorted perception of other people's communication may be more likely to become frustrated or aggressive. So if you feel that, oh, I'm not understanding, um, and I'm not understanding, and I don't know what this person is saying, because your chemical, the, the chemical state of your mind is altered, Obviously, you might be, uh, you know, or the person might be aggressive. So, yeah, and also when somebody is on drugs, you know, you can imagine if someone is under the influence of alcohol or drugs, you don't expect them to make good decisions, do you? So these today, this brings me to the end of today's lesson, which is basically the barriers to communication. As always, guys, if you need any support or any help, please do not hesitate to contact me. Thank you so much for watching, guys, and I look forward to seeing you all in class.